Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Brian Boyd. He is a University Distinguished Professor in the Department of English at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. He is known primarily as an expert on the life and works of the author Vladimir Nabokov and on literature and evolution. He is the author of the book we're going to talk about today on the origin of stories, evolution, cognition and fiction. So, Dr. Boyd, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. And it's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, first of all, do we have any idea where exactly in our evolutionary history we started telling stories? I'm afraid we don't. We don't have a, a clear idea of when we picked up language and the, the experts' ideas range from, say, 50,000, which I think is far, 50,000 years ago, which is far too recent to me, to maybe 400,000 years ago. I think uh, there are, there's other evidence that suggests uh, it, it should go that far back, uh, at least the origin of language. Um, and it's possible, partly because of the, the complexity of social structures and, and, and activities that humans were engaged in at that time, partly because of uh, fossilized evidence of uh, the descended larynx, the uh, hypoglossal nerve and, and so on at that time. Um, but uh, but I think probably humans were not quite telling stories, but engaging in something story-like from before they had language. So there are ex examples of, that I quote in the book of, say, chimps uh, playfully imitating another chimp with a with a limp, uh, a, a gruff old chimp, and behind his back they 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 play at imitating him. And and I'm sure that kind of um, mimetic as, as, as the uh, psychologist Merlin Donald calls it, mimetic behavior of, of imitating others in ways that that convey clear actions in a in a kind of decoupled mode, um, allow, allow other people watching to understand that an action is being imitated playfully. And so, so I, I suspect that was going on perhaps, you know, maybe 400,000 years ago. Uh, and, and as soon as language came on board, it would have automatically fit into that. And probably for a long time, uh, there were, as language was developing slowly into something from proto-language into something like modern sophisticated language, um, stories would have been very, very simple, but they would have been there, I think. Mm -hmm. But are there any other species we know of that uh, exhibits uh, any sort of artistic behavior or something that we could say is a precursor to art or not? Uh, yes, I, I think uh, the evidence of song, especially in, in birds, in gibbons, uh, amongst uh, primates and in whales and, and other cetaceans, um, there, there's evidence that there's a kind of competitiveness. Um, one, you know, one bird trying to outdo others. I mean, you know, males attracting uh, females uh, f for that reason because they can sing more more notes in more more varied way. Uh, there's also e evidence of, of fashions, so that whales uh, from from the Indian Ocean, I think, picked up a, a, a song that I think it was humpback whales that that was popular in the Pacific Ocean when the, at, at the borders where they met and carried it back into the Indian Ocean. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, there are things like uh, that especially, and, and of course dance for um, uh, for birds, uh, especially birds of paradise with their elaborate display dances, and uh, things like proto-architecture, if you like, in, in the bower birds in, in New Guinea. Uh, so, yeah, th these, these are small ways towards art, but I think that we can see the affinity. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, since in the book you focus on storytelling mostly, are there specific functions, social functions, for example, or others that it serves? Storytelling, well, I think it serves both individual and social functions. So uh, individually, I think it's it's really important in helping 
individual to understand uh, the ranges of human behavior, the ranges of human types, person, personality types, the consequences of your, of your actions and, and so on. Um, and uh, um, on, a, on a social level, it, it's very important for communicating shared values. Uh, there's a, a, um, a problem that economists call the problem of common knowledge. You know, you'll do something if you know that I'll do something, but I don't know that you're going to. We, we, we each have to know that the other is, is going to do this thing or that, that accepts the same value. Uh, and um, if if we we all know that we share the same values, then we're more likely to act on them if we expect that, that others are going to act on them. So storytelling is a marvelous way of communicating values in a very memorable, engaging way. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a sort of debate among people like evolutionary psychologists and people who do work in literary studies who apply an evolutionary lens to it uh, about the evolution of art. I mean, is it an adaptation? Is it a sort of byproduct of other adaptations? Um, Steven Pinker even calls it mental cheesecake. Do you have any position on that? I certainly don't accept the the cheesecake for the mind that he proposes. Um, I I think that the the, the distance between uh, adaptation and uh, byproduct and purely cultural is is has diminished uh, through the the development of evolutionary theorizing over the last 20 years. There's been a lot more emphasis on the fact that not only of, of cultural and biological co-evolution, but also of the fact that evolution, uh, that, that culture is itself an, a perfectly evolutionary product, uh, a process, that it, uh, it involves uh, variation and selective retention, and it's just one process, and, and of course, it's, it's only within culturally, within biologically evolved animals, and it has effects on them. So uh, I, I think the distinction is, is not quite as sharp or crucial as it used to be. Um, and I am very strongly influenced by the, uh, the linguist Daniel Dore of, in my recent work on the evolution of storytelling, who argues that language is a cultural invention but first, his, his little mantra is, first we invented language, then it changed us. And I think it's, it's the same with art, that first we invented art uh, gradually, uh, and, and then it, it changed us. So uh, our capacities, our, or the key thing really is our, our preferences, uh, our dispositions, both our sensory dispositions and our cognitive dispositions for the kinds of information that's in art, but also our disposition to play. And you put those two together and uh, I think you've already got the start of art. Mm -hmm. And do you think that something specific like sexual selection has played the role in the evolution of art? I think it certainly has, um, but as I put it, I, I think it's an extra gear for the evolution of art, not the machine that drives it. I think the, the, the thing that drives it really is our, um, our play with pattern, if you like. So uh, pattern is a way for minds to understand the complexity of the world. And our main advantages are uh, in, in terms of our capacity to understand the world. We don't have great physical advantages over other species. So um, I, I think I, I, I see art as a kind of individual and social play with, with pattern that develops minds and, uh, and shares experiences socially. Um, it, it's a kind of school for the imagination before there was, and the imagination in the senses, before there was anything like schools. 
Right. And what do you think about the Savannah hypothesis? I mean, the hypothesis put forth by some people claiming that uh, at least in certain forms of art, like the mostly the visual arts, we've evolved to appreciate the kinds of things that we tended to find in the environments we evolved in. Yeah, I'm rather dubious about that. I think uh, it, it's possible as an element of truth in that, but I think also recent uh, anthropological evidence seems to be suggesting that hominin evolution was going on on around Africa in all sorts of different environments. And that the savannah might not have been quite as uh, crucial to our becoming uniquely human as as it has, had been proposed. Uh, that, that's one aspect. And uh, an, another, well, yes, um, there is a kind of, I mean, we have a pleasure in, in gardens with trees and, and so on uh, in, in our uh, natural environments. Uh, it, it, that they're beneficial for us if we live in cities to have exposure to a little bit of nature. And so it's not surprising that uh, that's something that many of us like to see reflected in landscape art, say. But uh, uh, no, I, I don't think it's a very strong preference. Um, I mean, pe people, people like portraits, people like uh, abstract art in, in the kind of in tattooing uh, and and body decoration, say that's been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, there's there's no savanna in those. Yeah, I understand. And do you think that contemporary hunter-gatherer societies, I mean, the kinds of artistic behavior we find there, might serve as a window into how art might might have evolved in human societies? Yes, I think so. Um, there's a, a very important study by Polly Wiesner in uh, 2014 amongst the, uh, the hunter-gatherer in the Kalahari Desert. Uh, I can't pronounce the uh, <laughs> the name uh, with all those clicks and so on, but um, uh, she shows that the kind of storytelling, that the kind of uh, exchange of language that they go in for during the day is, is uh, functional. It's to do with their immediate needs and, and so on. It's economically or uh, it, it oriented. It's it's oriented towards the hunt and, and the sharing of goods and so on, um, resources. And when they gather at night around the campfire, then it changes. It what they do is they engage in playful stories and songs, and uh, and that's the kind of phenomenon you you find everywhere in the world. That, but during the day, uh, I mean, well, it's perhaps a little bit different now when you can plug in your iPod and, and take take the music wherever wherever you like. But but uh, and watch little snippets perhaps of of, uh, of TikTok or whatever. Um, but uh, you know, in, un, until very recently, anyway, uh, there was the pattern that people would come home from work and the families would gather around the TV and they would they would engage. They were, it, in the 19th century, they might listen to the paterfamilias uh, reading out Dickens. Uh, in the, in the 20th century, it was television. So uh, at, after the the day was over, mm -hmm. uh, that's that's one as one aspect. There's, a, there's a, another uh, another interesting piece of in, uh, evidence that came to light after I wrote the origin of stories, the work of Daniel Smith and others in the, amongst the Agta in the Philippines. Uh, and uh, who are a, hunter, uh, a foraging people, um, and uh, f for them, they break off into small groups for their foraging activities, mostly fishing. Yeah. Um, and uh, of course, they they want to their group to have the, the the best fishermen around, but they're even more interested in having the best storyteller. And the best storytellers, in fact, their groups are more cohesive and because they tend to have a, the, the stories tend to have a moral focus and uh, the, the storytellers actually are more fertile as, as fathers than than the non even than even the best hunters or foragers. Mm -hmm. So there's there's an interesting example of, of uh, both of the the kind of sexual selection aspect of things, but also the social cohesion aspect, and the, you know, being able to tell a story well 
uh, raises your status amongst your and, and it is is recognized as valuable to your your little group or your large group in the case of modern society. Mm -hmm. Do you think that to try to understand the evolution of art, we should approach each type of art individually? Or do you think that the evolutionary bases are the same for all types of art? I think there are commonalities, uh, as, as I said, the, the idea of play with pattern, I think is, is crucial to all kinds of art in, in the, um, I mean, obviously visual pattern for all different kinds of visual art and uh, sound pattern for, for music. Um, in the case of uh, storytelling, it's the patterns of human behavior human personality and so on, and, and the kinds of consequences of, of particular kinds of actions and reactions and uh, de relations between goals and di desires and intentions and outcomes and so on. Um, so uh, so th there you have it in a way. So the, there, are, there are common factors that pattern with, play with pattern, but also the, the distinctive patterns that reflect uh, the particular sense or mode of understanding that's being appealed to in a, in a particular kind of art. Mm -hmm. Are there specific cognitive mechanisms, evolved or not, that uh, are usually associated with artistic behavior? Um, <sighs> They're not uniquely associated with artistic behavior, I don't think. So, I mean, clearly we evolved to understand um, environmental sound very well, and that can be used in, in, in music um, and uh, to see uh, sight as our primary sense and uh, visual art has been with us for a, a long, long time. Um, Um, I I think the, the the key elements really are just uh, the capacities for comprehending the world. In the case of storytelling, that involves a lot of social cognition. Um, but these these are already there, but it mixes with the disposition to to play and the. And the so it's a it's a combination of. Uh, of those capacities and the the desire to um, activate them to the maximum in the in, in a non-threatening space available um, that that is key to art. So um, I think when when people challenge the idea that there is some kind of um, adaptive role of art. I, I like to bring out the example of, of beavers. If beavers didn't have a, a disposition to make dams, uh, it, it involves them in a lot of time and effort. If, if, it didn't, if it didn't have an advantage for them, then beavers that had a lesser disposition to build dams would thrive and the, the disposition to build dams would be bred out of, of that, those species. Uh, in the same way with art, I think, if we didn't have those dispositions to play with pattern in the way we do with art, then, um, it, well, if, if there were individuals who had a lesser disposition or no disposition to, to use all that time and all those resources in, in creating art, then we would have evolved humans who didn't engage in art. But of course, the amount of art that we engage in keeps on ramping up all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any major differences between the kinds of art and artistic behavior we find in our archaeological record and in contemporary hunter-gatherer societies and the ones we find in modern industrialized societies? Well, we don't have uh, storytellers from s stories from a long time back, unfortunately. Um, um, but we do have, and, and we don't. We have a few musical instruments, but they they don't really give us much of a clue. Uh, but we do have some visual art, and and some of that goes back uh, forty thousand years, maybe the very uh, early examples as far as we've discovered so far, but I'm sure it'll be pushed back 80,000 years. But um, 
one example that that I find very very striking indeed is the uh, the spear thrower from um, Mazdazil in in the south of France, uh, which is it's it's just a, a little piece of reindeer antler that's been carved um, to show an ibex turning its head, looking a female ibex looking at, at at the birth sac as, as it gives birth. And it's an extraordinarily detailed, um, a, a amazingly beautiful piece of, of work that uh, that involves fantastic observation and, and imagination, because clearly there wasn't an Ibex standing there doing this uh, as a model. Um, and it implies a huge amount of skill, uh, hundreds and hundreds of hours of work with stone tools. So this is from 14 and a half thousand years ago. Um, so s s certainly before agriculture. And uh, it, it also implies that the person who was allowed to do this, to take time off activities for gathering ordinary resources for hunting or whatever, um, that this was socially sanctioned and, and socially welcomed. So um, you know, I, that that's a, a, a good example of very very sophisticated art from very early. Um, I think in I I imagine that uh, storytelling would have been fairly simple. Uh, would have been well I don't know. <laughs> Myths and legends would have developed and uh, been passed on orally. Um, they probably wouldn't have been individually developed in very, very complicated ways, but they would have been elaborated as they were retold. And we certainly know examples of um, extraordinary memorial feats from uh, from bards uh, in various places who, who can recite poems of, uh, say, up to 10,000 lines. Um, and, and Homer, of course, uh, what... The, the Iliad is, is about 20,000 lines. He was doing that from, from memory. And uh, say the Maori in New Zealand had have elaborate uh, uh, genealogies that they tell would tell to one another that could would have something like 1,400 different characters in it and that they would all be spot on, you know. So um, they're, they're, and and they, they were uh, a Stone Age people and before um, Europeans came in contact with them and, and they had these these arts. So it, it's a good example of something that we do have a, a clear record of. Mm -hmm. So in trying to understand storytelling from an evolutionary perspective since until people developed, writ, uh, I mean, writing systems, we don't really get any sort of remnants of it in the archaeological record. How do we go about overcoming those limitations? Well, I don't think there's much we can do apart from from getting as many samples as we can from uh, from preliterate peoples, uh, and like like the Maori that I suggested, and and uh, the, the art of writing had been lost in in the the Greece of uh, Homer's day. Uh, they'd had it before, but then they, they had a civilization collapse and they lost that. Uh, so he was he was working purely from from memory. So um, and and you know something like the Odyssey is just immensely, or both the Odyssey and the Iliad in different ways are immensely sophisticated. Uh, the Odyssey in its structure, the uh, the Iliad, if you like, in its ethos, I think. Um, and uh, the fact that these you know, very substantial narrative works could exist in a, in a purely oral culture suggest that you know, it was possible. You, you'd have needed the social conditions to make uh, a bard um, prized in, in front of courts, I think, to, to a, allow somebody to develop their, their talent to such an elaborate extent. But yeah, you know, there seem to have been bards even in, in less uh, socially uh, complex societies. Um, I mean, if 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 you go back a little further to the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, you know, what's that? Uh, 
two and a half, three thousand years before the Odyssey and, and the Iliad, um, the storytelling seems to me much much cruder. Although there are some who who uh, who think very, very highly of the artistic quality of the Epic of Gil Gilgamesh. Um, but uh, that that was very near the, the invention of writing. Um, so, uh, but again, it was in a, a very complex courtly society. Um, and maybe it did take that to create, to so the conditions for uh, a storyteller of such exceptional power, like like modern novelists say. But on the other hand, um, there would have been priests uh, passing on, priests and, and elders passing on legends and, and myths uh, a, lot, a lot earlier, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Are there any human universals in storytelling? I mean, any aspects or elements of storytelling that we find virtually in all studied societies? Yes, uh, they're not the kinds of things that to some people say the five basic plots or seven basic plots or 35 basic plots, you know, uh, or, or special genres or, or anything like that. But I mean, they're, they're just very obvious things, really, like uh, a fascination with, with human character and also with with uh, non-human characters who've been anthropomorphized, with, with animal characters who have speaking roles, say, or with, uh, with gods or spirits or heroes who who have powers beyond the human um there are things like uh, just there's no i don't think there's a story grammar um except in the very basic sense it, just as i don't think there's a, there's a very uh, rich universal language grammar um but there are things like i mean obvious things like character setting the combination of uh, desires, intentions, goals, uh, actions, reactions, outcomes, setbacks, and, and, and so on, that can be recombined in, in an infinite number of ways very quickly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're almost givens if you've got language, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, I mean, are there parallels between the kinds of stories we find being orally transmitted and uh, literature itself? I mean, stories in their written form. Well, there are all, all stories really depend on devices for capturing the attention of, of others. And uh, so one thing will be uh, characters who, who are, you, you won't get routine events told as stories uh, uh, until very recently, until say Chekhov and, and Tolstoy couldn't understand what Chekhov was doing. Um, so, uh, so you're looking for ex exceptional events, exceptional characters with, with uh, striking personalities or striking powers and uh, and a trajectory of fortune that that goes from very high to very low and or back and back or reversals and surprises things like that they're they're common to all stories um there are things like the say versions of, of something like the cinderella story that are um Seem, seem to be all over the place and whether they were whether they share a common line of descent or not it's, it's, it seems unlikely that they did um, and uh, and you get variants of something like the, the Cinderella story being taken over say by by Shakespeare in King Lear or by Nabokov in uh, in his Arda um, and so yeah um, the, the idea of sympathizing with somebody who's downtrodden, who, who, who manages to uh, reveal her, her special character uh, in some way or another and, and be recognized. Um, so, yes, there, I think there are a lot of uh, commonalities. Um, and there, there are commonalities in, uh, in human behavior uh, and in, in 
the particular slants on human behavior that are characteristic of stories. John Gottschall, for instance, did work on folk tales across, uh, evolutionary work on folk tales across many different cultures. And uh, it, because he, he was interested in, in finding out whether the critique of uh, Western patriarchy was going to be exemplified in in other in stories from non-Western places, and of course he well he did find that that uh, that women tended to have the the more passive roles in almost in stories almost everywhere. Um, so, yeah, um, fortunately nowadays uh, things have changed, and <laughs> I was just watching on television tonight uh, a, a father who had two active. Uh, young daughters, uh, and he felt that there weren't enough stories for that, that showcased girls as as heroes, adventure heroes. So he wrote a story involving two girls who are hero, heroes, and and consulted with his daughters while he while he wrote it. Yes. Yeah, but I, I mean, do you have any idea if after the introduction of written languages and people? Uh, using them also to transmit stories and to develop new stories if something changed in the way stories are told i mean is there are there uh, major differences between orally transmitted stories and uh, written stories well again going back to the examples of homer um the iliad and the odyssey the, these are two orally transmitted stories that were then written down, um, but they seem to have been written down in a close, very full, in a form very close to the uh, the oral form, and they're immensely elaborate. They were they were vastly longer than most stories. Uh, I mean, even than most novels now, um, and. They they certainly have features that were uh, especially in the Iliad I suppose that are um, less characteristic of, of modern narrative. But most of the the modern devices for storytelling in in prose say uh, have emerged really in the last three or four hundred years. So it's a long time after the invention of writing. Um, it, it the the old uh, re Greek romances and so on say tend to be rather rambling, uh, rather, rather formless, um, as if they don't, because because they they don't have the limit of the audience's attention or the uh, the writer's m memory for for retrieving things orally. They don't know where to stop, and they just keep on piling on adventure after adventure. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and how do you account for the development of artistic preferences in people? I mean, how do people develop them? Um, well, uh, you're talking about individual variation in, in preferences or, yeah. Um, I mean, the thing is that we have individual variation on every possible measure that, like, you know, compu computers uh, can register 220 different uh, characteristics of, of the pupil of the eye. Um, you know, if, if we we look close enough, we we have variation all the way through. So it's not surprising. And and you know, we have variations in obvious physical characteristics and and obvious personality characteristics. So it's not surprising that we have differences in in dispositions towards particular forms of art. Or some people might have uh, a, a disposition to be not engaged with any kind of art, although there are very, very few, it seems to me, who um, don't have a, a, an enthusiasm for music, especially as in their, their teenage years. Nabokov, uh, who, whom you and I have both mentioned, was an example of somebody who who didn't have um, uh, any capacity for responding to music. And this is despite the fact that his father uh, would take, a, take him along to opera, and he'd sit there with the score of the opera. He has had an uncle who was a composer. His son was a, a bass, uh, an opera bass. Um, so, you know, there's a clear example of the environment usually would make a difference. It, it would help develop your preferences. But here, the environment just, just didn't impact on his uh, indifference to music. 
um, he, of course, he had very, very strong responses to both uh, storytelling and to visual art. But uh, yeah, um, in, individual differences is just all the way down, I think. And uh, and of course, uh, it depends on cultural cultural circumstances, the way those things are going to get, going to get channeled, even within, within a particular art. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was also wondering if there are any relevant differences in the art appreciated by the elites, let's say the high art and the, the types of art that uh, so-called common people tend to appreciate. I mean, if it would be, if it would have anything to do with social status or something like that. Yeah. Um... One thing I, I would say first off is, is that some of the arts that we now see as as classic are began as as popular. So plays in Shakespeare's day were not considered high art. Poetry was, plays weren't. And now, of course, we regard Shakespeare's plays as perhaps the richest we've got in, richest thing we've got in literature. Or or Dickens's novels were were distributed in in serial form uh, in weekly installments that outsold the uh, the London Times and uh, were, were read around the, the fireside by to, to, by fathers to the to their family uh, or Don Quixote for instance um, in in the in the 18th century was was read in in I, I know in in England anyway I, and I presume it was even more the case in Spain but uh, earlier perhaps um, that uh, in the 18th century was translated into into English and was very very popular would be get read to servants and and so on you know um, so there I think there's a lot that appeals uh, to to a very wide range that you know that is um, that we also consider a high art, um, and and if you think well, that the, the, there are forms of art that uh, that tend nowadays, uh, well, at least in, in some communities, to get associated with high status. So opera outside Italy, perhaps uh, Italy, Italy, it's it's much more a popular form, but. Elsewhere, it tends to be a, a high status thing, but uh, somebody like Tolstoy, who was a count, uh, denounced opera because he, precisely because of, he, he thought it was artificial and, and uh, status, too status inflected. And he, in fact, well, he, he's an, a very interesting example. He uh, renounced, the, when he had his religious conversion in the 1870s, renounced his uh, his writing novels for for quite some time. So after Anna Karenina, and after perhaps you know, the greatest of, novel of all, um, he he started writing little animal fables um, that could be understood by anybody. And there is a there's a you can understand the tension. You want to to reach absolutely everybody. On the other hand, you want to put as much as you as you possibly can into the art form. And uh, he he was torn in both those directions. Most uh, most artists aren't torn in in those two different directions. They choose one or the other. Um, clearly, uh, very uh, very demanding, very complex works are going to have a, a lesser audience, and they're also going to be seen as uh, they're going to be, be prized by an elite, and and there is in a, in a certain way. Um, Elites might become, do become, I think, snobby. Um, they they prize difficulty, uh, the uh, for its own sake, perhaps, or or, or uh, fashionable avant-gardism. Uh, that they they pride themselves in being able to get what others can't, or then or they you know they they disdain popular appeal. Um, but there's a, a huge range of gradients, I think. Uh, and I, I, for me, the the most interesting art is, is that which appeals to uh, uh, both the connoisseurs and the common common person. So, um, one of, one of my favourite visual artists is, is Hokusai, and he was working in prints that were considered very low art in Japan uh, in his time. 
and now of course he's probably regarded as, as their greatest painter ever uh, and, and he's wildly popular across the world. His uh, great wave of uh, uh, what's it? of Kanagawa is is um, probably the the most the best known work of visual art, at least from 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 Asia, in the world, uh, and it's it's reproduced everywhere, and everybody admires it. Um, uh, and and yet it's got incredibly subtle things going on in it too that that you can see if you take the time, which most people don't bother doing. Uh, so he was building in uh, a, a, an astonishing immediate impact and all sorts of layers that uh, that you could look at if you if you chose. And I think I, I, I think Shakespeare is like that as a storyteller. I think he was uh, telling stories that that anybody could get uh, in language that was over the head of most people, even in his own time, I think. But then he, he repeats things. He makes them so so forceful that even if they only catch uh, a fraction of what's being said, they'll understand the situations and the characters, and they'll be moved by it. Uh, you know, however sophisticated they are. Mm -hmm. But do, do you know what makes certain pieces of art successful and others not so much? If I did, I'd be creating them. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, explaining stories uh, doesn't really give you uh, how they function, how they've, how they've arisen and so on, doesn't really give you a a guide for producing them. I think uh, they're, they're quite different talents. I mean, it's, it's like um, uh, explaining the physiology and the psychology of, of jokes, uh, of humor. It doesn't make you a good stand-up comic. And, uh, or, or explaining the, the physiology of, of the body, uh, what makes uh, a, a good runner. It doesn't make you a top sprinter or a top marathon. They're, they're quite different sides of of the activity, and uh, so, um, I mean, I, well, I mean, I, I do pick particularly successful stories in the origin of stories, the Odyssey, uh, as as the the greatest story I could think of, close to the recorded origins of stories, and uh, and a Dr. Seuss story. Um, which is as close as, as we can get to to a masterpiece, I think, that's understandable by children at a very, very young age. And, uh, and in both, there are common characteristics. There is a larger-than-life hero uh, with with big stakes. Uh, it's returning in, in the Odyssey. It's, it's uh, Odysseus returning a after 20 years of absence and, and restoring his kingdom to its uh, its full glory in um, Horton Hears a Who, it's uh, Horton the Elephant, who is again, you know, of course, a, a larger than life character, an elephant. Um, and he, he's saving the lives of this tiny little people, the, the Who. Uh, he's, he, he's, avoid, he's, he's stopping genocide. And, you know, the, the stakes are huge and, and, and the trajectory of their their actions, their their situations goes from catastrophic to triumphant, and uh, and there are clear, clearly defined uh, allies and enemies. So you know, common features like that. Uh, but uh, you know, knowing those things is not going to mean that you can create a, a story that's going to necessarily wow an audience. Although um, maybe these days with uh, things like the the Marvel franchise, you've got a, a kind of a template. Uh, I, I, I'm afraid I can't watch those. <laughs> I find them too silly. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'm in a minority. <laughs> yes. So uh, is there an element of conspicuous consumption in art? Yes, uh, I think there, there certainly is, or there always has been. Um, I think both on an individual and a collective form. If you think uh, collective forms, uh, I mean, th things like uh, the, cathed the great cathedrals of Europe are artistic objects, uh, among other things, or uh, say just a, a detail of the 
cathedrals like the baptistry doors in Florence that Ghiberti worked on for 33 years. Um, uh, and that was that was a way of Florence advertising its its riches and, and its class. Um, and individuals, of course, yes, uh, like to uh, uh, acquire uh, um, extraordinarily expensive works. There's, there's just a, been a case the, the last few days of a, a couple, a divorced couple who, whose art had to be auctioned and going for 670 million. Yeah, uh, it's a clear, it's a clear sign that uh, that you have made it more than anybody else. If you don't have the talent, at least you get the talent to create the art. At least you you can you can own it. Uh, yeah, it uh, it doesn't thrill me that aspect. But so I, I rather like the uh, the democracy of storytelling. Almost anybody can uh, can afford a book um, or, or a you know a, a Kindle version these days. Uh, or, or or switch on a television and, and enjoy a, a, a story there. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you look at the relationship between art and other forms of human expression or institutions like religion, for example? Well, I think the re relationship between art and religion is very, very close indeed, or it, it has been. I think, in fact, you know, for probably for most of human history, as long as we've been hum humans, as long as we've had language and as long as we've had art. Um, religion has probably commandeered art most of the time. So if you think of um, myths and legends, they they tend to uh, valorize the, the tribe or the people uh, and, and to impart values there. They're exciting forms of storytelling. I mean, even the the, the Christian stories, um, and uh, where was I going? Um, uh, um, I I think you know things like um, visual art is commandeered for for makeup, for body decoration, for elaborate costumes in, in ceremonies and rituals. And there, there are, there's a Nigerian people that, that build these elaborate houses just for a religious ceremony. It takes them a couple of years to work together to build these elaborate houses and then they trash them. Uh, but it, it's an important religious ritual. And um, I think that that's been important for, you know, for as long as religion has made a difference, um, religion seems to have a clear role uh, in binding societies together, in, in uh, enabling them to cooperate better, in enabling them to, to share values and to cooperate. And, uh, and the arts, the, the sensory appeal, uh, sensory and aesthetic appeal of the arts amplify the the appeal of religion, the storytelling appeal, the ritual appeal. So song and dance and, and costume and uh, body decoration, all these things uh, amplify the power of religion. And, uh, and really, I think that if you, if you look at um, um, certainly, well, the art of, of the, the Middle Ages in Europe was so saturated by religion and the the popes were the great patrons of their time um, in artistic matters um, it, it really is it's only in the last few centuries as we've become more secular I think that that art has been quite strongly severed from religion in in Western cultures um, Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, still on that topic and perhaps to a certain extent going all the way back to the question I posed earlier, is art an adaptation? Is it a byproduct or of adaptations? Is it a cultural product, etc.? Do you think that uh, art in comparison to other human activities is special in any way or not? Oh, definitely. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the uh, the foremost theoreticians of 
art from an evolutionary angle is uh, Ellen DeSanayake, uh, an American anthropologist who uh, married to a, uh, a Sri Lankan, which is why she's got that surname. Um, and she actually defines art as making special. Uh, I don't know that it, yeah. So uh, it, it's making a moment special, making an experience special, making you know a visual impression special or a sound special uh, or a sequence of events. And uh, yeah, I, I think it is uh, highly special in that um, it's something that we do that doesn't have any immediate benefit, uh, immediate obvious benefit uh, in, in terms of our survival, uh, but yet it has entrenched itself into the human repertoire ever, ever deeper. Um, I think, so in a sense, it's like play, uh, which is also special because it, it, it too is removed from the pursuit of immediate material advantage or, or social advantage. Oh, well, it gets it gets linked with social advantage, I guess. Um, but, um, um, we, well, OK, it's a little bit different with professional sports people these days. But uh, in, in the past, uh, play was uh, was a little outside the routine of what was needed for survival. And yet play is um, is there in practically any species you, you look for. It's, it's there in every mammal that's been looked for. It's there in, in some reptiles and in, in, in certainly in birds uh, and in some uh, invertebrates like uh, octopi. So um, play is, is something that develops skills in, in downtime, uh, in non-threatening moments that you can use in moments where you really need them. And in, in the same way, I think uh, the various forms of, of art are, are built on play. They develop our cognitive and, and social skills in moments of where, where we can relax, when we can engage in play safely uh, or in, in, in art. And they develop these, these skills in ways that might make a difference to how we perform socially uh, in, in in more demanding situations. Mm -hmm. So do you think that being exposed to art and more specifically storytelling is something essential for child development, for the development of uh, certain human psychological abilities? Well, the fact that it's uh, stories are swallowed quickly by very, very young children uh, who are neurologically normal. Um, you know, it, it's different for autistic individuals, say, uh, who have difficulties with social comprehension. But for, for most neuronormal, neurotypical people, storytelling is absolutely compulsive from a very early age, which suggests to me that, yes, it, it's it's a, an evolved way of, of training minds in understanding the the, the sheer, the, the complexity and the flexibility of human behavior, the, the range of possibilities of, of human behavior. I mean, no other species has a, a range of behaviors remotely like what we have at our disposition. And storyteller, storytelling, I think, uh, both trains people to, to follow that kind of complexity and to see how wide open the options are out there. Um, so I think uh, that, that there are indications that I, I don't have it with storytelling because I don't know that we have examples of uh, children who, who are neurotypical who do not engage in stories. But there's an interesting parallel that the one common factor they found in a, a, a very large scale study of murderers in in the US, where they have a lot of them, um, is that they didn't, many of them didn't engage in play as, as children. And so it's it's not art, but uh, it's it's something, you know, that I stress is, is quite similar. Yes. So I, I think, uh, I mean, I think 
if an otherwise neurotypical child did not respond to stories, I, I would think there would be evidence that, yeah, well, maybe you need to you need to work very carefully with this child. Um, you you need to understand what what is uh, what the child lacks that that uh, deprives them of the interest in stories. Mm -hmm. I, I I think you know it's 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 like uh, it's like a, an inability to acquire language. Any neuronormal child can acquire language and can, can acquire many languages if they're exposed to them early enough. Um, it's just it's just part of the human repertoire. Mm -hmm. So do you think that stories also contribute to the development of theory of mind in children and that perhaps also allow for people to expand their empathic concern to others? Yes, I think so. Um, uh, there have been studies of, of theory of mind and and uh, and storytelling. It it seems that uh, people in whatever culture develop theory of mind, but those where storytelling to children is is natural develop theory of mind capacities at an earlier stage than those who are uh, who are in a culture where it's not usual for adults to talk to children. There are some cultures where children are, are not really talked to until they're about four. And they, they do have a slower development in theory of mind characteristics. Mm -hmm. And in terms of empathy, yes, well, it, you know, um, the uh, Persian writer Nizami uh, expresses the idea in the, what, the 12th century, I think, that to, to create a really interesting uh, battle story, you really need to engage the audience's interest in the emotions of the characters on both sides. So, and, and of course, that's just superbly done in the Iliad, uh, where uh, the, the Trojans, the, the suffering of the Trojans is, is really the end point of the story, you know, um, and, uh, Priam's grief for his son is, is you know, so heart wrenching, even though he's from the, the opposite side as you'd expect. And so yes, empathy, uh, it's, it's the first gr really great war story and the first really great anti-war story to me. Uh, and yeah, um, uh, there, there seems to be, I, I, I'm not sure Certainly, Stephen Pinker makes a case that uh, even though he, generally he he thinks that art is cheesecake for the mind, he he also um, sees the value of, of storytelling in particular and talks. He, he cites uh, examples from the historian Lynn Hunt and I forget who, who others, two, two or three others, who track the um, the decline in capital punishment, the rejection of severe incarceration and the open, the uh, movements against slavery to the power of fiction, power of novels especially, to put you in the perspective of those who are suffering in these situations. And uh, yeah, that, that did have a, 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 he argues anyway, and, and so does so do these historians that it did have a, a kind of ameliorating effect on uh, on social concern for, for the uh, the really suffering. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I, I mean, I, I think he mentions that literature first in the better angels of our nature, and then he reinforces it in enlightenment now, I think. So um, are there ways of creating stories that work and others that don't? I mean, because since we have uh, many different kinds of authors and many different kinds of exposing a narrative, I mean, is there some sort, uh, do you know of ways that tend to work and others that usually do not? Well, um... 
I, I mentioned the examples of the Odyssey and, uh, and the Dr. Seuss, Horton, Here's a Who, where you have larger than life characters, high stakes, uh, and clearly defined oppositions of, of uh, favorable and un unfavorable characters, th things like that. Um, but the, the thing is that uh, storyteller, st all art thrives on attention. And uh, if you repeat the same formula again and again, the, you attend less and less. Uh, it, it, it seems, well, it, it, it's, it's a phenomenon of neural tissue that it responds less to the same stimulus over time. And uh, so that, that means that, well, there's, storytellers have a, have a choice of, uh, and any artist, have, have a choice of what kind of audience they want to appeal to. They, they size up their situation in most, uh, say, tribal societies, it would have been the whole group. You, you'd want to speak to the whole group. But uh, in, in more complex modern societies, uh, we've got very differentiated populations. You can appeal to the largest group of, you know, Marvel storytelling, say, Marvel films, or, or, or uh, in the case of J.K. Rowling, say, to, to, to children around the world. Um, uh, or you, you, you can choose to write for an elite. Uh, so you will get the status of, of respect. You, you won't be seen as a, as a trashy airport novelist, say. Uh, you'll, you'll be seen as a, as a classic. So James Joyce was ready to go to the extreme um, and in, in Ulysses and even more in Finnegan's Wake. So he's appealing to those who, who are ready to put in the, the kinds of effort needed to enjoy those books. I, I love Ulysses and I hate Finnegan's Wake. So I've never read more than a bit of it. Um, so you know, there, are, there are different kinds of trade-offs. So if, and, and in Joyce's, say Chekhov and, and Joyce are both deliberately going against the, the long traditions of storytelling where you do go for dramatic events um, and you, uh, you compress events so that there's, there's time for a, a lot of different trajectories of fortune. And Chekhov and, and, and Joyce especially perhaps the Joyce of Dubliners take uh, or, 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 or Ulysses take very everyday actions and um, uh, t tends to be a short time involved, certainly in, in Joyce. Um, so there's not, not room for a lot to happen and yet he investigates it in, with a new kind of honesty and clarity that appeals to, to some. It's not going to appeal to many, but it's going to appeal mightily to, to some. And he has chosen the kind of audience he wants. Uh, so it, it's, it's very much a, a trade-off. Uh, you, you can't appeal to as wide as possible an audience and give them as much complexity as, as you could possibly imagine. Uh, it's, it's just not going to work. So you've got to decide where on that spectrum your your interests uh, are going to lie and if you want to uh, appeal to the elite you're going to do that in part by jettisoning some of the things that have been popular in storytelling and by looking for other features um, like the the uh, the rhythms of Bloom's mind, say in Ulysses, that that are going to appeal very much to to some people. And in fact, I would think I would think you know if if the rest of the book wasn't so difficult, everybody would love uh, following Bloom's mind uh, <laughs> because it gives gives you an insight into human nature that that just is not available in any other any other character or story, if you if you like. Um, so. Yes, yeah, so there are so many different ways of, of telling stories successfully and so many different measures of success depending on your, your tastes or you know, the, the social array of tastes in a given world. Mm -hmm. Do you include, uh, let's say, collective narratives in the domain of stories, like, for example, things related to nationalism, patriotism, and also what we find in, for example, religion? Uh, if you mean particular stories, I mean, 
clearly uh, there are a lot of uh, collective stories in in our history and in, in myths and, and legends. Um, the the word narrative has started to be used in in very very loose ways that I don't think have much to to do with actual narrative. Uh, and if you're talking about the the narrative of a particular people, uh, or yeah, it it it, it just it just doesn't have much to do with uh, with storytelling. On the other hand, if you're dealing with the uh, the, the heroes of a particular culture, um, the the legendary figures, yes, um, that's that's been crucial, I think, to storytelling. I mean, again, to go back to the the Maori example that I know from living in in New Zealand, um, their heroes are, uh, are are central to their imagination. Um, Maui as the discoverer of the North Island uh, that, that, that I'm living on. I fished it up from the sea, um, according to, to Maori myth, or, or uh, Tani, the god of the forest, who separated uh, Papa Tuanuku, the, the sky god, and, and oh, sorry, Rangi, uh, the, the sky god, and Papa Tuanuku, the earth god, goddess. Um, and, and that was their, their kind of creation. These things are, are collective. And they're they're central to Maori self understanding, and I think that's that's been the case for almost every people. Mm -hmm. And do you think that people need narratives to function properly psychologically? Yes, I think so. Uh, there there are some who who think that uh, that we understand experience as narrative, that we understand ourselves as narrative, in, in narrative terms. I think narrative is, is very important, but I don't think that's the case. I mean, if I, I, can, I could create a, a narrative of myself, of, of my whole life, if, if there was some, you know, for a CV or whatever, a, a, a little bio in a, on a blog or whatever, uh, or but it all depends on you, there is there are a trillion different narratives you could tell about yourself, and they depend on an audience and a, and a situation. Uh, you don't have you're you're not constantly adding to the last page of your biography. You're just living, and um, so in that sense, I don't think uh, narrative is uh, psychologically embedded in us the way some psychologists will argue I, but on the other hand i think we we sift experience in narrative terms we we look for what's worth mentioning to somebody else that that's happened uh and uh if we're especially if we're a, a vivid raconteur say we we can entertain people we know we can entertain people with uh, the, these uh, out, examples of outrageous behavior or, or so on um but but also as consumers of of narrative i think uh, we we all learn through the the sheer uh, plethora of um of stories we encounter in the course of our, our lifetimes from from childhood on and nowadays, of course, with uh, all the media we have at our disposal, audio books and, and so on, um, it, it, it gets wider and wider. And if, I don't uh, play computer games, but again, they have a very strong narrative element these days. Um, and um, well, a, a, a question that, that, uh, that does arise is that Perhaps uh, is there an evolutionary mismatch between uh, the availability of, of stories now and the super availability, the abund overabundance of stories, the, the the infinite range of stories we could engross ourselves in, and uh, and our predilection for stories. In the in the past, stories would have been available only when there was uh, the most gifted storytellers in the tribe was had a moment to tell them now we can saturate ourselves in stories all the time and it's possible that just like the uh, the appetite for fat and sweet was was of advantage in our evolutionary conditions of adaptation um, 
when when those high energy products were valuable to acquire and it made sense that we would particularly reach out for them nowadays when there's uh, an abundance of fast food and junk food and, and uh, candy uh, available it's not very good and there's an epidemic of diabetes around the world and it could be that there is something like a, a kind of psychological diabetes i don't know um with uh, with the uh, overproduction of uh, over availability of stories i mean i, I think the, the benefit one gets from immersing oneself in stories must plateau at a certain point i don't think you know reading uh reading or, or watching uh, an, another stories for another few hours is, is going to ramp up your your social psychological skills appreciably uh and it might deter you from uh, from engaging in re more rewarding things so um i think that's something that really needs to be investigated and I, I'm, I'm not sure how you'd do it uh, and and of course it's it's possible that that exposure to well ex exposure to pornography and exposure to violence may not to pornographic stories and to, to violent stories might not help uh, people's psychological health so uh, mm -hmm. those, those are questions to be considered yeah so going back to Steven Pinker for a second, because in his book, The Blank Slate, I think it's in the last chapter on art, he sort of uh, criticizes what has been happening in art since the modernist movement. And he sort of says that the quality of the art that is produced has been on the decline since then. And then he talks about ways of trying to improve it uh, with some evolutionary principles in mind. I mean, do you agree with that idea that the quality of art has been on the decline? Do you worry about it or not? No, I don't think uh, I don't think it is the case. I think um, I, I I tend to be too busy doing other things to read a lot of recent fiction. But uh, you know, some of the examples I know are, are, are very fine uh, and the average level of say serious literary storytelling is is ramping up all the time as they build on techniques that have been discovered by great innovators uh, so they may not be great innovators themselves but these techniques are readily available now and and the kind of um, uh, psychological and structural uh, complexity is, is there um, and, and it appeals appeals to many um not not to everybody they're they're not necessarily best sellers but there's there's still a large tranche of the population that is interested in those things um and i i think uh stephen is um I, I heard him at a conference shortly after that book came out, and he said he was bracing himself for for attacks about what he said about uh about gender and and so on but it but it was the the, the chapter on art that really got him attacked um but uh no i th i think there can be a lot of pretentiousness and and uh and snobbery in in avant-garde art and there is you know there is a lot of bad art being produced but then i think that's always been the case um that we just we just don't even look at all the dross that was was done hundreds of years ago it's only the the really precious things that survive and uh yeah um i mean take well this is slightly different but it, when impressionism came in into existence in, in the 1860s 70s 80s um, that was seen by by many as a decline from the academic values of the old artistic tradition uh, and, and embraced with fervor by those who were more uh, more open-minded, and, and of course now it, it's uh, it's available to everybody. The 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 impressions are popular with everyone. It it just took a little bit longer to see what they were doing, uh, but now everybody is is trained in that way of of looking at a canvas. Um, I think that there are certainly there'll be some forms of modern installation art that I think will be uh, seen as cringeworthy in the future uh, and they seem cringeworthy 
now perhaps to, to some, but 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 there, there are other things that in installation art, say, that are that are just um, totally mind blowing and and offer you experiences that you couldn't have possibly have had in uh, simply sticking to canvas on on walls. Um, so I, I think uh, Stephen is wrong about uh, about his judgments about art. There, uh, I, th there are perhaps more people producing art uh, than ever before, and that means you're going to get uh, more mediocrity. But I think uh, th there's there's always uh, amazing discovery being made. Uh, I mentioned installation art. I was I was actually um, in. Uh, a, a co-curator with Stephen Pinker of a, an art show in uh, the Museum of Modern Art, uh, sorry, a Museum of, of Old and New Art in, in Australia. And each of us was invited to um, propose, the, so there were four of us, in, including uh, Jeffrey Miller. So, that, of course, he proposed the sexual selection and, uh, and uh, Steve Pinker pr proposed the, uh, the the pleasure buttons hypothesis of art, if you like, and I proposed that play with pattern, and there was a neuroscientist uh, whose take was slightly different. But um, we were all in, invited to propose our own account, evolutionary account of the origins of art, and to select works according to to support our hypothesis and to challenge the other co-curators' hypotheses, and. Uh, for me, what the the opening room of my I had eleven rooms that I filled. Um, the opening room had to be uh, an installation piece by Yayori Kusama. I don't know if you know her dots obsession rooms. Uh, just uh, the uh, look her up when you <laughs> after this is over. Yayori Kusama. Um, they're just extraordinary. You go into them and the the sense of of play, of exhilaration, uh, when you're enfolded in this this the space of sh soft shapes with these. Uh, in in my case, I wanted it to be, uh, as I'd seen in uh, other places, she's done um, yellow a yellow background with these enormous black dots, and um, she she is doing art that I think is as. She's still she's still producing art at a great rate in her late 80s, um, and she she's opening up. She has been for for 60 years. She's been opening up possibilities in art that I think were were untapped and and yet that that dive deep into, um, you know, as I would put it, play with pattern. The the appeal, the immemorial appeal of of art. And, but she's refreshed and she's she's earned attention. She's the the most uh, the the most exhibited artist uh, around the world uh, in the last ten years. Uh, in, in her, during her eighties, yeah. Yeah. So uh, just one last question: Since your account or how you approach literature and storytelling is done through an evolutionary lens. Do you think that in some way it runs counter to, to other dominant approaches in literary studies, like the more, let's say, post-modernist ones, for example? Oh, definitely, yes. In fact, it's, uh, it's regarded as anathema by, um, by many in mainstream literary studies, or especially the, the post-modernists. Um, just mentioning uh, biology seems to be a no-no. They, they seem to uh, assume that evolution is uh, is somehow retrograde. They, they associate evolution with social Darwinism, which actually had very little to do with 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 Darwin, and in fact was uh, well. It, it, it's a complicated story, but uh, those who embraced Darwin in the 19th century tend, tended to be progressives rather than uh, reactionaries. Um, and uh, and e evolution, of course, is a theory of change. And uh, when in the modern understanding of evolution, where culture is itself a perfectly evolutionary process within biological evolution, the, there, there should be no opposition. I, I think um, most resistance to uh, 
accounts of literature from an or you know, accounts of literature or art from an evolutionary perspective simply uh, don't bother reading what we write. Uh, they assume it must be wrong and uh, and, and vilify it from a distance. Um, they they assume that uh, we can't explain. Uh, th that we can only explain species typical behavior, but uh, if you accept that uh, that culture is uh, itself an evolutionary ex uh, process that depends on uh, variation and selective retention, then you're going to have uh, different cultural channels developing in, in all sorts of different directions, proliferation, just as there has been in biology. And uh, I spend a lot of emphasis in my on the origin of stories on art and storytelling as depending on the artists or the storytellers trying to secure and maintain the attention of an audience. And I think um, that has actually, it, if, you, if you think of art in that kind of a way and you look at the way uh, a particular artist at a particular point of their, their life with a certain reputation, uh, known for having done certain things, uh, perhaps wants to refresh attention by doing something different or, or on the other hand they could cut costs by doing something similar uh, um, but if, if you look at uh, the the problems facing individual artists in terms of maximizing the kind of attention that they're going to want uh, you can actually look at the the details of a of a work of art or of a story uh, in closer attention, closer detail than ever before. I, I think I've done uh, a follow up to On the Origin of Stories. I thought it was going to be the start, the first chapter of the next, the continuation. But it turned out to be a book in itself on, on Shakespeare's sonnets and uh, which are not narrative. And I was going to have that one example of uh, well, some people think that the, the sonnets tell an, a narrative. I think the evidence of the sonnets themselves shows that it doesn't. And, and so I was was looking at how Shakespeare earns attention both by doing something different from he he'd triumphed in the, the main forms of narrative of his time in in uh, tragedy, uh, comedy and history. And here he wants but by an early age, and at, at that point, he wants to do something. He wants to earn attention by appealing to an audience, doing something other than telling narrative. And and so I was looking at how the, the various ways he he captures attention, uh, and the various the, the particular problem that he's engaged with at the particular point in his career, where he's. Uh, where he has a reason to, to, to try something other than the narrative. And, and I think it, it, it threw up a lot of details that were you know, unknown to, to even to experts on the sonnets. Uh, so uh, it, it doesn't mean uh, a kind of broad brush, brush generalizing of human nature. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the book is again on the origin of stories, evolution, cognition, and fiction. Uh, Dr. Boyd, where can people find your work on the internet? Um, well, that book, I guess, it, through through Amazon. I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's perfectly widely available. Um, I think it's I think it's available in an ebook form now, um, and. Uh, Unfortunately, the, the catalogue of On the Origin of Art, that exhibition that we did, is very, very difficult to obtain. So I don't try and, and get that. But uh, On the Origin of Stories is, uh, I think it's um, it, it's available in Spanish, uh, in, in, in quite a few languages, but in, oddly uh, in Korean. And uh, I was the first of my books to go into Korean. And, um, and I think there are supposed to be uh, Arabic and Turkish editions coming out, but uh, I don't think it's a Portuguese edition. No, I don't, don't think so. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's readily available. Okay. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. And thank you very much for your good questions. 
Hi guys, thank you for watching the interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show. It's thanks to people like you that it keeps running. I will leave links in the description box to Patreon and PayPal. Any amount, even just $1 per month, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Peruga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Ernst Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bordarno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Espinha, Phil Cavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Robert, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreff, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenk, Wal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslin Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassil Adez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punter, Adana Ruzmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, My Producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Taffini, Akion Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardis France and Thomas Trumbull, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.